I read this morning from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 16, and I begin reading at verse 1. Matthew 16, verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting him desired that he should show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and alluring. O oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you do not discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. We are going to zero in on verse 6, where Jesus said, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. The New International Translation reads, Be careful. Jesus said to them, Be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It really is saying the same thing. Be careful. Beware. Be on guard. Let's pray together. Our gracious Lord, most loving Lord, we thank you for your word. It truly is a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. And we pray as we carry these moments together that your word would become alive to us, find its mark in our hearts, bringing praise to yourself and profit to us. Give us understanding to learn this morning that which you want us to understand and know for our good. It, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. These words which we have read together this morning are the words of him who said, I have not spoken of myself. The Father who sent me, he gave me a commandment that I should say and what I should speak. John chapter 12 and verse 49. This is the voice of our beloved Lord. It should excite our hearts when we hear him in his word. It's the captain of our salvation who spoke these words. He's the good shepherd. He is the head of the church speaking to all its members. What our Lord says should be to us of very grave importance and of great worth. We have heard him say, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. But we are also to hear him say, Be careful and be on guard. Be on guard. Be careful. Our Lord is not speaking to the worldly, ungodly crowd. He is speaking to his own followers. And pointedly, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 5, to his own disciples. He is speaking here to men who were the ones who were to be the first to carry the word of salvation to the lost world. And yet, to them he says, be careful and be on guard. This should tell us a great deal. One thing it says is that all of God's people ought always to be on guard. It says that every believer should be on guard. Watch and pray. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41. Lest you fall into temptation and be overtaken with a fault. None is so holy that they will not fall. No infallible people in the assembly of God's people. God's children, saved by grace, members of the body of Christ, the church, are still only men. In a general sense, they are yet in the body, and they are yet in the world, always exposed to temptation, and they are able to make mistakes. In practice, yes, but also in doctrine. This means 
that we as Christians should live like we are in enemy land, putting on the armor daily. Yes, and I suggest even sleeping in it. Brethren, let's never forget the failures of Noah, Abraham, Lot, Moses, David, yes, and Peter. Remember them. Be humble, be on guard, lest you also fall. We ought to be on guard, humble and cautious. Let's not think that we who are saved by grace and kept by grace, that we shall never fall, for the Lord promised to keep us in the palm of his hand. Let's not ever forget how many have begun well and run well for a time, and yet later turned aside. The Lord addressed the words, be careful, be on guard, to the twelve apostles. He also addresses the same words to us this morning. Be careful, be on guard. Now, what is the reason? The danger against which we are to be on guard. He tells us it's the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The warning is against false doctrine. We are, as Christians, exposed to persecution of all kinds. Our natural man loves pleasure. We have a tendency to love money. And I believe all this was a danger to the apostles as well. For they were also men of like passions as you and I. But here the Lord gives us no warning against these. The warning is the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, what did the word leaven mean when Jesus spoke? In verse 12 we read, He was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, what were the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? For most they were formalists and self-righteous. They held the traditions of men of more importance than the inspired word of the Old Testament. The most important thing to them was the ceremonial part of the Mosaic Law. They made much to do about outward behavior of religious activity, things that can be seen and praised, such as washings, purifying of the body, touching a dead fly would defile them. They took great pride in paying their tithe. They loved to be called rabbi, doctor, or pastor, and many more, too numerous to mention. But you get the point. Read more about this in Matthew chapter 15 and chapter 23, and also Mark chapter 7. Now follow me carefully. They did not deny any portion of the Old Testament scriptures, but they did set the word of God aside by putting their interpretations, their traditions which actually bury the scriptures. This is what the Lord warns us against. This was the Pharisees. The Sadducees were a little different. They were the rational thinkers, you know, free-thinking. They believed in no resurrection, no angels. They loved to raise difficult questions. For example, it was the Sadducees who asked the Lord about the woman who had seven husbands. And the question was, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Matthew chapter 22 and verse 28. They observed the law of Moses, so we could not say they were infidels. Many of them were priests in the book of the Acts. Caiaphas, who condemned our Lord, was a Sadducee. Their chief aim was to throw a doubt in the mind of anyone who had faith in any revelation, to put a cloud in one's thinking. Skeptics they were, free thinkers, rationalists. Our Lord said, be on guard, be careful. We have a right here to ask why. 
Why did our Lord Jesus give us such a warning? Especially when he knew 40 or 50 years there would be no more of the school of the Pharisees or of the Sadducees. The Lord, knowing all things, knew the temple would be no more, Jerusalem destroyed, the Jews scattered all over the earth. Why the warning about the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? I believe this warning was and is for the welfare of the church. The Lord, with prophetic knowledge, saw that the plague of the Pharisees and the doctrine of the Sadducees would harass the church. He knew there would be Pharisees in spirit and Sadducees in spirit among professing Christians. Of course, the use of Pharisee and the Sadducee names are no more, but the principle exists. Jesus knew that up to the time he would return, there would be those in the assemblies who would add to the word and others would subtract from the word. Was our Lord right in giving us this warning? Church history tells us there was a reason, and our Lord's warning was indeed necessary and correct. Don't you think that in our day our exposure to false doctrine necessitates this warning? We have, first of all, those who teach with boldness that the Bible only contains the Word of God. Not everything in it is inspired. Others will not, they do not preach or teach the atoning work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Strange views about eternal punishment. Experts in raising doubt, clever in destroying people's faith, but powerless to offer anything else in its place. These are those who do not realize they are the descendants of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I may sound hard, but the danger is far greater than most of us think. The books some of us read are most devastating. They excite our thoughts on religious issues which bring no good. If we love life, life in the spirit, we ought to search, search our hearts, try our faith, and make sure we stand on right foundations. Let's be very careful that we do not take in the poison of false doctrine and fall from our first love. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4. I know how hard it is to speak about false doctrine. It's unpopular. Some say it's not charitable, even it's narrow-minded. But you see, I have to speak up, for many people cannot tell the difference between sound doctrine and false doctrine. To some, a sermon is a sermon, or one doctrine or another doctrine, no difference, unable to understand. Lest someone out there think that this is my narrow mind, I will hide now behind the scriptures and see what they say. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, the Sermon on the Mount, we read, Beware of false doctrines, said the Lord, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Paul writing to the Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, Beware. Be on guard, lest anyone spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. First Epistle of John chapter 4 and verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Preachers of fake doctrine will not claim they are teaching false doctrine. They do not advertise openly that they are trying to turn away people from the truth, as it is in Jesus Christ. They come in secretly, quietly. Jude verse 4. They crept in unawares. The reason our Lord used the word leaven is because all the people understood. 
And we should also that in the making of bread, a very small portion of leaven is added to the lump of dough to make bread. But this small lump of leaven works quietly and without noise to permeate the lump of dough. Our Lord wants us to know that is the way false doctrine works quietly, secretly in the heart once it is planted. It begins to change the thinking with which it is mingled. It's important to think and receive the lessons of wisdom that this simple word leaven has in it. False doctrine is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Satan dressed as an angel of light. These are the most dangerous enemies of the church today. An illustration how this works. They will not openly disagree with you. They agree with you on all points in your doctrine. They will not suggest any change at all. All they want is to add a little more to what the scriptures say and what you believe in in order to make your Christianity perfect. They say, believe me, we do not want you to give up anything you believe. We want to share with you a few more clear points about the church. You should add, they say, this or that in the order of your church order and your church discipline. If you do that, you will be quite okay. Leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Be careful. Be on guard, our Lord said. Another. They will not suggest to set apart or throw away any part of truth. He wants us to become a free thinker, a skeptic. How does he start? We should consider other opinions, they say, since after all, they may be as right as you are. This is designed in a subtle way to lead us to believe perhaps all people, whatever they profess, will be saved. They go on. It's not that important to insist on the inspiration of Scripture. Their approach is covered with old-fashioned views. Narrow-minded theology is what they say. Think up to date. Accept other views. At least think on them. Time to remember our Lord's words. Be careful. Be on card. Unless we resist these principles in the bud, the little leaven will spread. Beginning with vague, innocent talk about charity, you can wind up in the doctrine of universal salvation. Beginning with a dislike to saving grace as an old-fashioned, narrow, exclusive religion, you may end by rejecting every leading doctrine of our Christian faith, the atonement, the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and so on. None of us can enjoy safety in our faith unless we remember the Lord's words. Be careful. Be on guard of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I want to mention here uh, some safeguards against the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees in our day. I believe we need the guidance, the teaching of God the Holy Spirit in our hearts and to keep us in the faith. We also need to be on guard more, to pray to be kept and preserved from falling away. And yet, there are certain truths which we find it necessary to keep in mind. For an illustration, when a particular epidemic such as the flu is all around us, flu shots are very important to keep the flu away from us. So it is in the church. We are instructed to grasp certain truths and hold on to them firmly and not let them go to avoid the leaven. First, pay attention to what the scriptures say about total depravity of human nature. Total depravity is no small issue. It's not a partial, only a skin deep disease. We are not only poor, pitiful sinners in God's sight, 
We are guilty sinners. We deserve God's wrath and God's condemnation. This we all must come to understand to be saved. Wrong diagnosis of a disease will bring with it the wrong remedy. Wrong views of the depravity of human nature will always, not sometimes, but always bring about wrong views of how to cure that corruption or that depravity. We are instructed to grasp certain truths and hold on to them firmly and not let them go to avoid the leaven. Secondly, this is important in view of all the translations we have of the scriptures. Hold on firmly to the doctrine of inspiration and authority of the scriptures. All of the Holy Word is inspired, not one part more than another part. There is a great chasm between the Word of God and any other or all the other books of the world. We have much in the Word we cannot understand. If we are to believe only that which we understand, then there will be very few things we will believe. This book is the only rule for faith and practice. 2 Timothy 3.16 and whatever is not written in this book cannot be required of anyone as needed to salvation. Also, regardless how well new doctrines may be presented and defended, if they are not in the Word of God, they should not even have our attention. It makes no difference who says it, deacon, elder, pastor, or even the Pope. If it's not in the Word, it's not worthy of your time. We are not to believe anything if it cannot be proven by the scriptures. This means we must use the Bible as if we believe it was given to us by inspiration. We will not understand it all, but we must read it with reverence. As in our daily pursuit of life, many things we do not understand, so it is in the book of God's revelation. We must draw to the book of God, not to teach, but to learn, like a humble scholar seeking to understand it. Brethren, the greatest truth for us to maintain in a hostile world is to understand our position on the atoning work of our Lord and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The death of our Lord was no common death. It was not the death of one who died to give us an example of self-sacrifice or an example of self-denial. The death of Jesus Christ was an offering to God, his body and his blood to make atonement for sin. That is, your sin and my sin. The sin of everyone who comes to him in faith. Without him, without the shedding of blood, there could not be, there never was, any remission of sin. I do not know what your response is to this subject. I do not know on what side you are. But I want to kindly warn all of us, if you find nothing in yourself responding to what we have said, you have reason to be alarmed. There are many today who are turning from the Word of God. Many are darkening God's counsel, and we have many victims. To my fellow believer, I leave you with this word. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Mark it down. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Examine yourself whether you are in the faith. To my unbelieving friend, I say, why do you not believe? The invitation is gracious. We have laid it out simply. Why will you not turn to him and live? What you think about the cross of Christ, I do not know. But for you, I pray and wish that you would cry out, Lord, save me or I perish. He promised he would do just that. The invitation to come is from him, not from me. Again, he says, come, I will not cast you out. Let us pray. 
Our Father, for your word, we thank you. We thank you that it did come to us this morning. Be pleased by your Spirit to write its truth afresh on our hearts. Accept our praise and our thanks. And for that one who heard it, but has not surrendered to it, open their heart to receive it as your call, your invitation to salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.